I want to excuse Drs. Lorna Torres and Ansek Young, who could not be with us today. All participants in this roundtable acknowledge and honor the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are presenting. I give respect and recognition to their ancestors, elders, and any Aboriginal people present. We also acknowledge the Kulin peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of Footscray, Melbourne, where the conference organizers and Victoria University are located. The purpose of this roundtable is to reflect about the impact that international community psychology conferences have had on the discipline and practice of community psychology. I will be joined by Meg Bond and Christopher Keyes from the United States, Pesania Velasquez from Peru, and Blanca Ortiz Torres also from Puerto Rico. The round table will start with a brief presentation of the results of a content analysis Dr. Torres and I carried out of the programs of the previous international conferences. When I finish, my colleagues will present their reactions to the information I presented, and given time limitations, we will answer your questions and receive your comments. So let me begin by sharing my presentation. You all see it? Okay. So what have international conferences contributed to community psychologists, to community psychology? Um, let me see if I can move this. Okay. As most of, of you know, international community psychology conferences started in 2006. And in the past 14 years, 17, seven conferences have been hosted in the Americas, Europe, and Africa. The conferences are not organized by any particular entity. Um, they are in fact um, mobilized by the energy and interests of community psychologists. As you can see in this table, participants in the conferences increased steadily uh, up to the Africa conference in which, although there was a smaller number of participants, larger number and again increased for the, la the conference previous to this one in Chile. The Americas, including the Caribbean, Europe and Australia have had participants from all conferences. Participants from Asian countries have attended five conferences and three conferences have had participants from Africa. I believe that most of the people that attended these events think that they have facilitated sharing work from different countries, networking, generating research efforts from varied nations and various publications. We have organized, as I mentioned, this roundtable in an effort to present empirical evidence about the conference's impact and examine what the evidence tells us about these events. To do this, we will present results of a preliminary content analysis of the programs of the previous seven conferences, which then the roundtable participants will reflect upon. We carried out, Dr. Torres and I, a, a content analysis of the programs of the previous conferences, and in some cases had to use compilations of abstracts to complement the programs that we uh, obtained. We used titles of the presentations as our unit of analysis, uh, being cognizant of the limitations that titles have in terms of not necessarily describing the contents of the presentations. Each one of us analyzed three and a half conferences and in total 4,711 presentations in three languages. We encountered various difficulties. As I mentioned, there were incomplete programs. Some of the titles were not only not necessarily descriptive, but also hard to understand or were confusing. Different terms were used for the same phenomena according to the different countries or even within the same language. One example that I like to use is the example of empowerment 
which has at least three terms in Spanish, empoderamiento, fortalecimiento, and apoderamiento. And we were also faced with our limited knowledge of Portuguese, particularly when analyzing the programs from Brazil and Portugal. Overall, the effort was much more time consuming than we anticipated. As a result, we developed the following categories, theories and concepts, research methods, interventions, populations of concern, education and training, and a miscellaneous category for presentations that did not fit the previous categories. It's important to mention categories were not included in interventions and populations of concern or were included in theories and research methods, et cetera. When we examined the results of data across all categories, by far the category with more titles was theories and concepts followed by populations and interventions, and the least mentioned were research methods and education and training. When we look at these across the conferences, which means also across time, because as I mentioned, the conferences have occurred over a 14 year time span, you can see that the pattern is basically the same across that time, with the most in theories and concepts and the least in education and training. Examining theory and concepts in particular, we found 481 theories and concepts mentioned, most were mentioned once. And the one most frequently mentioned was community psychology in which we included social community and clinical community. And interestingly enough, violence, all sorts of violence we included there, gender, sexual, war, criminality, among others. In research methods, we identified 80 mentions and the most frequent was, were methods in general and participatory research followed by program evaluation. And it's interesting to know that case studies, narratives, and many of the titles of participatory research related to qualitative studies. Within interventions, we identified 130 kinds of interventions in which community interventions were the most mentioned, and these include community action, praxis, community development followed by programs, which refers to work done within government or nonprofit organizations. Public policy was important as were interventions with art, including all sorts of manifestations of art. In populations of concern, by far the most mentioned was youth and adolescents, followed by geographical communities and children. Um, although it's interesting that older adults and the homeless were also included. And finally, within education and training, the most mentioned was service learning or different kinds of practicums and community internship experiences within the community stemming from the university. There was also some talk about teaching community psychology and education and training in general. So that gives you an overall view, and we're now ready for reactions and comments from our panelists and from participants. We're going to start now with Tesania Velasquez um, from Peru. You can go ahead, Tesania, when you're ready. Thank you for the presentation of Irma and Lorna. I have to give the first reaction to this important work. The results present get us to some very interesting thoughts. In my case, I will focus on two outcomes. On one hand, I will be addressing the issues of violence and its growing interest from community psychology. On the other hand, 
I will be talking about community psychology training and its presence in the conference. Finally, I will make a comment from my experience and participation in the conference as a Peruvian community psychologist. The violence issue. It's a subject that community psychologists investigators have been focusing on the last years. In general, violence, its multiple manifestation and the response of, of community psychology to its effects have always been investigated. But right now, the focus is on the concept of violence, which is being problematized and theoretically updated. We seen that the presence of post-conflict and post-disaster context in our countries requires us to place at the center of community reflections and practice the issue of violence. Both contexts imply a disruptive situation that impact on community relationships that causes an effect on the social environment and a reduction on people's possibility of trusting on a healthy coexistence. Nowadays, violence is not only expressed as a structural and social issue, but is present in people's daily relationship as a result, gender, sexual orientation, age, and other categories are necessary variables for our analysis. The prevalence of people who are victims of violence globally require us to ask ourselves as community psychologists some of this question. How to incorporate the political dimension when we analyze violence and its multiple manifestation and impacts on population? How to define and theorize violence as a system of oppression that affect the dignity and freedom of individuals and community? What is community psychology's contribution in the understanding of violence beside our help in minimizing the harm caused by violence? The community psychology training. This subject, it started to become more visible in recent conference. These issues with the development of different community psychology programs at university. And we have observed in more in Latin America. However, this topic is not only discussed in the formal field of university, but also in other areas with community actors. We have seen different presentation with an emphasis on the need to critically reflect on the teaching learning process of future community psychology professionals. We believe that this aspect has developed in response to an economic and social context where education becomes a service, not always of quality, and loses its right character in a context of adverse policies and economies is a challenge to work from the ethical and political position of community psychology. That's why it is critical to rethink our knowledge on community psychology training. Reality requires to have professional and disciplinary tools that lead us to social transformation at the global level. But these tools should also allow us to get closer to the people with whom we wish to work to improve their resources and capacities and should help us to look at our reality based on the, uh, our ownership of right, inclusion and participation too. For that reason, the most reflective and investigated aspect in community psychology training are based on the dialogue between theory and practice, where the ethical aspect of field work play a fundamental role. As we know, 
community psychology focus on psychosocial conditions that individuals, families, and communities experience understanding community as an active agent and not a receptive one. For that reason, community psychology training requires us to understand and take action on our realities, knowing people's necessities, especially of people in vulnerable situations, and to explain them in the classroom. For example, how to train people to work the lockdown context that doesn't allow physical contact. In addition, the Red Latino Americana de Formación en Psicología Comunitaria emerged 10 years ago. At last year's conference, this group has been having meetings. The aim is to sustain a dialogue and knowledge construction space about community psychology training. Following that line, they publish research about ethics on this kind of training and the labor of community psychology in many countries of the region. Finally, I want to address some thoughts from my personal experience as a participant in this conference. Peru is one of the countries whose presence and participation has been increasing in the last conference being even greater when the location of the conference is in our region since the cost of moving to another continent impedes our participation. But also because the development of this discipline is recently being settled in our country. I recognize many of the contributions shared in the initial events, such as a development of discipline or the formation of research network or publication. However, I think that maybe a greater impact of conference includes the possibility of building a community of community psychologists, and not only the creation of a space to share the result of our research at the global level. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, for those interesting remarks. I'm sure we'll come back to them later. And now we move on to Chris Keys. So good, good day, whatever part of the day it is in your part of the world. Uh, we're we're uh, gl glad that uh, Irma ha has uh, invited us to comment on this uh, interesting compilation of uh, data from the uh, programs of conferences past. <clears throat> Overall, I think we can see that uh, ICCP is a vortex of activity for the field. It's a very generative enterprise. Um, it's noteworthy how these conferences are growing in general in size over time and including an average of almost 700 presentations per conference. Um, it's interesting that while the numbers of countries and people vary a bit, the numbers of presentations are going up every time. That stack of lines that showed the different uh, uh, kinds of categories represented at different conferences is exactly in order from uh, Puerto, Puerto Rico to Santiago in terms of laying out the uh, numbers of presentations in each area. They are either staying the same or going up every time, every place, mostly going up. Uh, so this is a, a vibrant enterprise uh, and suggests that community psychology is a vibrant uh, enterprise around the world. I, 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 my, my question for Irma would be whether you anticipated anything quite, uh, quite this exciting and energetic when you started things in 2006. <laughs> Another question is, what do the results reflect about the directions the discipline is developing? I think clearly there's a strong emphasis on theory and concepts that we see, and it outstrips the interest or the uh, reports on populations and research methods, which to my mind at least suggests that the, the odds are that we're emphasizing the, the uh, the research, uh, not the research as much as the as the theoretical papers, often uh, critical theory 
uh, papers and commentary as in the presentation that uh, preceded this one, um, which is a very stimulating uh, a yeasty kind of thought and one that in the United States we're uh, growing in our interest and attention to, but which is generally underrepresented and, and has, has been historically in community work. Um, another thing that uh, Irma's analysis shows is that there's a strong interest in youth and children relative to other populations. Uh, and th this, this is an un th this is a little bit surprising uh, because we don't, at least I don't think of community psychology as uh, fundamentally a, a, a field about children and youth, but um, clearly it's a very well represented part of what we do and part of our uh, uh, connection with uh, developmental psychologists and uh, uh, I think that's an area that can be mentioned more and thought of more in terms of who we are as a, as a field. And the emphasis on qualitative methods seems to be greater than that on quantitative from the methodological categories that, that Irma presented. Uh, and I, I would say in the United States, community psychology is a leader among psychological subdisciplines in its emphasis on qualitative work, which has spread to education uh, research in general. And, and of course, anthropology's ha had it for a much longer time than, than uh, psychology. But it, it's uh, nice to see community psych so, sort of pioneering that in psychology as a discipline. In terms of the results that were surprising, uh, the <laughs> interventions with art uh, surprised, surprised me and delighted me a little bit. I, it's another area I don't think of as being central to the field, but one that taps into different ways of thinking and approaching and, and connecting with folks. Uh, so it's good that we're doing that and I'm, I'd be interesting to do a intersectional analysis and see to what extent are those efforts uh, also involving children and youth and to what extent other, are other age groups involved. Um, and as a, a, a person with mostly uh, gray hair, at least the hair that remains, uh, I was happy to see adults as a, older adults as a category, also another group that uh, I think we don't usually think of as community psychology material. <laughs> Uh, but we should. So uh, yeah, fr friends of mine say that topic is very interesting to them and gets more so every day. Um, in terms of other analyses that would be fun to take a look at, it would be interesting uh, to look um, in, a, in a more micro way across conferences and see what topics are flourishing, uh, not in the large categories, but in, in the subcategories. Uh, you know, what, what kinds of violence are being focused on? What, what aspects of community psychology and the like? And how does that vary over time? Are there topics that are growing in interest? Any topics that are uh, getting reduced interest over time? Um, and it would be interesting to know more about the ideological perspectives that are uh, represented. I, I, I don't think we have a wide range of ideologies necessarily, but I don't know. I, that would be an interesting thing to look at. Uh, and it would also be interesting to look in terms of what kind of community psychology is going on in, in different countries and different continents uh, if, if we sorted out the presentations uh, by the, the home uh, of, the, of the presenter. And I can keep going, I'm, uh, unfortunately, or better, for better or worse. Uh, but the trends in the handbook, uh, it'll be interesting to know, know there whether the trends that uh, we, we found in looking at the handbook chapters are similar or different from those that, that uh, are evident here in, in the conference. So, I just want to underscore uh, 
to Sonia's uh, point about building a community of community psychologists and I think helping us connect, helping us be uh, be critical uh, and, and uh, helping energize us and, and connecting us with this worldwide enterprise is a, is a you know wonderful things we can get from ICCP. Uh, so I hope we'll look for ways to, to do that in between conferences as well as during them. And I want to thank Irma and Blanca and others for uh, initiating this effort uh, at the University of Puerto Rico in 2006 and helping it to be sustained over time. Uh, while there's no organization that runs the ICCP meetings, uh, the secret and important reality is that Irma is an organization all by herself and she uh, has played a role in just about every single one of these in terms of helping them uh, develop and draw on the wisdom from previous conferences. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, and just to answer very briefly your question about did we anticipate this? No. In fact, we decided not to call the conference in Puerto Rico the first conference because we weren't <laughs> sure there was going to be a second one. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so we were very pleasantly surprised when they continued to, to flourish. Okay, um, having said that, our next um, discussant will be Blanca Ortiz Torres, also from Puerto Rico. Please, Blanca. You're muted. A second. You're, you're still muted, Blanca. Blanca, we can't hear you. Yes, but um, I am unmuted. Okay. 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 Now. okay. Um, good evening in Puerto Rico. Uh, and I'm sitting on Taino land here in San Juan. I want to thank Irma and Lorna for this work and for inviting us to reflect about it and share our views here. Their analysis is the kind of thing that you're always curious about, but never get to actually explore it. First, some general reactions. A first general reaction is, wow, what an enormous number of presentations, 4,700 uh, work uh, or, or um, presentations. It is great to confirm that our colleagues and peers are hardworking and productive community psychologists. It also tells us that we feel invited and convocados y convocadas to participate in the conference. As a member of the first organizing committee, as Chris mentioned, it feels so good to see that the conference was a great idea that has evolved into a significant contribution to the discipline. I have very vivid memories of that first organizing process in Puerto Rico and the joy we all shared when we adjourned 14 years ago with the hope to reunite that group at some point in the future, which is what we have been doing. I am impressed by the diversity of areas and themes that have been discussed at the conferences and particularly to see how the work on theory and concepts have increased and strengthened. Certainly, we have done a lot of thinking and reflection about the discipline every time we get together in this international conference. I think it is interesting that education and training are the least frequent themes. This is something I worry about at this moment when I perceive that community psychology training programs seem to be disappearing in various places. Probably my concerns reflect our experience in the social community psychology program at the University of Puerto Rico, where as of June of next year, we will have lost 
80% of the faculty. That is, only two professors will be left out of nine it had when I joined the program 25 years ago. Although I was surprised to see that the area of violence is the second most presented and discussed, I was also happy to see the wide variety of contexts and manifestations of violence included in this domain. I think this speaks about what has been a consistent interest in the discipline, that is to understand power relations, oppression, and equality. I'm also glad to see that public policy is a recurrent and important theme. I remember how approximately 30 years ago, it was an emerging area in which only a few of us worked. Now I can see the growing interest in public policy among my students and how more and more they understand the need to be trained in this area if we want to promote social change at the structural level. I have a question for Irma and Lorna though. Why do you separate interventions with art from the rest of the interventions. Irma asks us, what do results reflect about the directions in which the discipline is developing? I sense some sort of disconnect between the dominant themes described by Irma and Lorna and the topics and domains some of our colleagues have been paying attention to. For example, I don't see the coloniality in the findings, which I know has become an ongoing theme, at least for the past five or six years in this conference. I would like to know how often it is being discussed and whether the colonial approaches are being incorporated by our colleagues in their research and action. I am convinced that this is an important area of development in the discipline. I would also like to see if there has been a growing interest in non-traditional ways of gathering and conversing within the conference. This is, has the structure and organization of the conference changed? Also, it would be interesting to know how diverse is the group of people who attend the conference? Are they mostly academics? Do students attend the conference? Is the conference appealing to community psychologists relatively new to the field? Finally, I share with you some recommendations mostly related to the organization of the conference. I want to congratulate the Melbourne organizing team for their extraordinary effort in obtaining input and feedback from a broad group of people around the world. As a result of this openness, they were able to add diversity to topics and presenters. I have seen in the conference sponsored webinars, new faces, as well as others who are not regulars of the conference. I would stimulate future organizers to follow this example. We need fresh ideas and innovative and creative ways of gathering and exchange our knowledge, concerns, and hopes. As I have participated in all the international community psychology conferences, I feel I belong to a community of international colleagues. I can say that I have met the majority of my community psychology fellows at these conferences. I miss them between conferences, keep in touch with many of them through the year and have developed effective links with a good number of them. This is, we are now friends. While facing the gradual disappearance of the discipline in Puerto Rico, at least in the academia, attending the International Community Psychology Conference gives me energy and hope to keep working and thriving for empowerment and social change. This year, because of the pandemic, I am missing the challenge of our intellectual exchanges, the plans we always make about future collaborations, the after sessions catch up conversations, and why not? Our evening outings, 
to share a drink and have a more personal contact. We are living very challenging moments around the world, and it's not only because of the pandemic, that impeded our gathering in Melbourne. But I am sure we are contributing to the fight against the pandemic in our countries. I hope to see you soon. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca. And now um, for uh, our last panelist, Meg. Well, hello, everyone. It's it's always challenging to go last because other people have raised such such fabulous points and observations. But let me also add my thanks to Irma and Lorna for this fascinating analysis. And I have to say this process of self-reflection is so central to our roles as community psychologists. That is taking time to reflect on whether our work is truly syntonic with our frameworks and values is central to who we are. So I congratulate them on um, the massive, but you know, and extremely thoughtful analysis. Similar to others, um, taken as a whole, I think the results are make it clear that these international conferences are vibrant contexts for our field. Um, as mentioned by others, I was impressed by the extent of coverage of theories. Um, I think that, that these conferences are really stretching the analytic grounding of the field and are an important countering to the dominance of perspectives from the global north. I think that's an incredible um, contribution to, to our field as a whole. The participation across continents, including so many diverse voices in our discussions is, is truly dynamic and, and enriching for our field. And the breadth of methods, the emphasis on qualitative methods is also an important catalyst for the field. And as, as others have noted, I love seeing that so many sessions are about the use of arts in promoting social justice. And it'd be fun to explore that a little bit further. It's also clear that the potential of these conferences goes beyond session titles. So I have some comments that invite additional reflections. Um, some of these questions can and some cannot be addressed through the current data. These, my follow on um, questions and reflections are gonna revolve around three issues and they're very much related to, to Sonia's comment about building a community of community psychologists, Chris's endorsement of the value of similar ideas and Blanca's comments about both the structure of the conference and the valuing of friendships that have grown out of these conferences. So my comments focus a little bit more internally to the conference process. I'm gonna to refer to these three themes and issues. First one is crosstalk, the second one is serendipity, and the third one is collaboration. By crosstalk, I wanna to refer to the dynamic where one comment can transform another, where exchanges that produce new ideas and insights, exchanges that truly alter our thinking and produce new approaches and new knowledge. Along these lines, I was struck by Irma's comment um, toward the beginning of her, her um, presentation about there being different terms for similar and overlapping approaches and phenomena of focus, large, some language related, some um, country of origin. But this was labeled as a challenge, and I can imagine it certainly was made it very hard to identify cross-cutting themes. But I also, my reaction was also that this divergent is potentially an exciting resource for the field. You know, if we engage in crosstalk, that means we're engaging with one another across these differences and hopefully enriching all of our, our ways of thinking. Now, some of the questions for further pondering that are related to this theme of crosstalk um, are related to what, what is really happening in the conference setting. So we know that the conference organizers strongly encourage and require that sessions include participants from multiple countries. But I'm curious how many sessions really end up crossing borders. And when they do, are we fully realizing the potential for the kind of talk and exchanges that transform our ideas? In other words, how often do the exchanges within sessions really embody dialogue versus parallel play? And can we explore what forces might facilitate um, furthering this kind of dynamic crosstalk at our conferences? 
the last two plenaries at this conference, there was a lot of fascinating crosstalk. They made space at the end of the, the, the um, panels for that. But I wonder, how, does that happen in other sessions and across other conference settings? So the second theme that I wanted to comment on, um, I'm referring to as serendipity. It's become one of my favorite words these days, <laughs> but it's the opportunity for connections, ideas, et cetera, to emerge without planning. <clears throat> and the reason why I've been thinking about it a lot lately is this word really feels particularly important at this moment because it, for me, it summarizes the essence of something critical that we've lost in the pandemic. We rarely just bump into one another. We rarely have chance encounters. So in terms of conferences, for me, there's a tremendous value in what happens between the formal sessions, in the spaces in between. And these can become opportunities to meet new people, as been, has been mentioned by others, and also opportunities for informal discussion of each other's work. Um, and as has also been mentioned, uh, may produce personal connections that can endure for years, like some of um, Bianca's um, comments. So for further assessment of the impact of the conference related to serendipity, it would be great to explore um, whether the opportunities that have been um, structured to enhance serendipity are actually realized. There are some in innovative formats have been designed and there are several at this year's conference. But I'm also curious what formats have been tried at other conferences over the years and what's been the impact for creating new ideas and for fostering collegial relationships. So the final theme I wanted to comment on is collaboration. And that's basically the question there for me is, how is the impact of crosstalk and serendipity? Does it endure after the conferences? And essentially do crosstalk and serendipity evolve into opportunities for new and or strengthened international collaborations? I think if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that it doesn't matter where our collaborators live. So why not explore this potential even further, I'm sort of struck. We, um, Irma and Chris and I co-edited the handbook and we always did it on conference calls. And now I'm thinking if only we'd known about Zoom, we could have had a lot more fun. <laughs> um, that's an example of a collaboration that certainly could have benefited from our new wisdom about um, how, to, how to work across boundaries. But anyway, the questions that emerge related to collaboration for me is, can we figure out what new collaborations have emerged from these conferences? We're not gonna know it from, um, session titles, but it seems an important question. And can the organizers think about a future conferences, think about additional deliberate proactive ways to promote collaboration that extends beyond the end of the conference. So I'll, I'll end my thoughts there to make way for discussion. Uh, but again, a big thank you to Irma and Lorna for kickstarting this set of reflections. Thank you. Um, I think we've had a lot of really good ideas in the reactions and um, I have a couple of comments and a question and the comments uh, have to do with the data so I'm going to answer those first and then I think mm -hmm. the question is something all of us can react to. Um, First of all, there's a comment that says, um, I might have missed it, but I'm wondering whether papers related to specific mar marginalized or radicalized communities. Um, and yes, there were um, papers about the LB LGTB community and a lot of papers about poverty, which had to do with, of course, poor communities or for poor people a lot of papers about victims um, and also uh, papers about organized groups like women that worked uh, to combat violence, etc. Uh, there's another comment that says, I am disappointed to not see any real representation of people with disability. Um, I checked the data while we were talking and there were only, um, let me see here a minute, 15 titles referring specifically to people with disabilities, which is definitely very low considering we examined 4,700 titles. That's like really terrible. 
So it may be that people didn't include it in the titles. I mean, we have to really be aware that these are titles, you know, that these are not like the entire, they're not even the abstracts. And so there may be more, but I don't think it's a significant number or anything. So it's an area that definitely we should look into and promote. And I also want to, while I'm doing this, answer Blanca's um, question about interventions with art. I looked at the data and we had 24 kinds of interventions. Re remember that the categories were not mutually exclus exclusive. So the category of interventions um, had all of the interventions, including those with art. But within the interventions, the one that had the most mentions, I thought, was interventions with art. And we're talking of interventions, for example, um, with sport or with spirituality or with um, games, et cetera. Um, but the most that had within the large category was interventions with art. Okay, having said that, oh, and another thing that has to do with your mention of decolonial, decolonality and, and colonization, there were 27 titles in the data that specifically mentioned that concept. Um, which I think is a concept that has come up in the recent conferences, not in the, you know, like maybe in the last two, like since Africa and not frequently in the previous ones. Okay, and then I think this question is good for everybody. So um, I would like you to react. It says, considering the activist social justice values purported by community psychology, have we become too comfortable focusing on theory? How do we translate this meaningful reflection into meaningful and iterative action? So what are your thoughts? Hi, Wolfgang. Hi. Maybe, maybe our panel isn't the only one to answer this question. I think it's a good sure. discussion question to get input from everyone because I think it is striking how many of the the conference sessions talked about um, theory and even the the discussant on the the plenary that we just talked about she she commented on how some of the papers were very very theory heavy and a, and a couple of them that she commended were ones that talked about putting some of this theory into action so mm -hmm. I I think it's a it's a it's a great question, and I'm curious to hear what other people think. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's a question that's occurred to me uh, as well, uh, and I was heartened to hear uh, both uh, David Fryer and and uh, Regina Langap talk about their activist side as well as their critical side, and and. To, to sort of help make explicit that those coexist. Um, and I think, you know, the more they can inform each other and, and the, the more that it can become an, in, that can become an integrated whole, the better. Um, so, um, but, but I, I think we need to be looking at that and, and lo looking at our, our thinking and our research and ask how, how can that manifest itself in terms of influencing uh, public policy as, as Blanca was suggesting and uh, into other forms of intervention and action. So. I think Wolfgang. Wolfgang. Yes, yeah. you wanted to say something Wolfgang? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Yes, I'm happy to be with you because I didn't plan to travel to uh, Melbourne originally. So uh, this is a new opportunity, maybe. Um, uh, I've been pretty much impressed by the first uh, panel of this conference because it, for me, it opened up a little bit like a new world for community psychology because, or a next step for community psychology because what was highlighted was, uh, uh, although it's it's important to to uh, have a basis in, in theory, uh, there are other knowledge uh, fields of knowledge uh, in the world 
which are important for community psychology, especially from indigenous people. And that's uh, uh, the, the, the good thing to be in Melbourne and in the southern part uh, of the world. So uh, because there may be even more uh, inspiring things happening there. Uh, but also I had the feeling that uh, community psychology is becoming slowly, still slowly, a uh, political field and an activist field as well. And that's always, uh, in, uh, as far as I have seen it in the last 20 years or something uh, on the international field, that there was always uh, something like a conflict between the field, the discipline, the scientific discipline of community psychology, teaching and research, and the activist part. And maybe that's changing right now. So, and, and I think uh, it would be encouraging to, uh, to support this, this, this track and this, this discourse about how could we bring together the both tracks of, of, uh, of our field. The other th uh, comment I wanted to make because especially during the pandemic, I've been very active in different uh, international networks uh, beyond community psychology, which had an, affect, uh, an effect on community psychology for myself. So we started to set up a, a, a regular talk about uh, community psychology in times of pandemics. What does it mean to us? How do we link it to uh, and some of you may have seen that. Uh, and how does it, how do we link it to uh, climate change and uh, um, uh, social injustice and, and violence in the world? And how, how could we be active in that? And, and uh, parallel to that, I've been part of a global movement uh, uh, established by uh, Otto Schama from MIT, which is not psychology at all. It's, it's a completely different thing. But if you look at uh, uh, his work, he's, uh, he started to create a, a global movement for societal transformation, which is very close in many fields, very close to what we talk about in community psychology as well being an, uh, an activist movement, both and a scientifically based movement. So I think that is the promising thing. And that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe you didn't think about that when you started it, Irma, uh, the, the, the first uh, international uh, idea, but uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty convinced that that uh, this came out of this movement you started, uh, uh, bringing together people on an international scale from different cultures, from different areas, from different thinking, ways of thinking is extremely important. And maybe uh, community psychology uh, is now on the, I don't know how you say it, on the fringe of a, of a new step maybe on, on the, so on the, right on the cliff. And we should have a debate, uh, how do we use that? Do we go back, reluctant, don't, don't jump, or uh, do, we, uh, do we have the courage to jump and find some serendipity on the way? Right, right. We have uh, like, like one minute, so well, go ahead. I was curious ahead. If, if Daniel, who, oh, well, Georgelina George looks like she has a comment, so I'll, I'll, I'll step back. I was going to see if Daniel, since he wrote that okay. comment, I, he wanted to comment on it. Hi, I'm Georgelina. I'm sitting in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Sorry for my English, but I want to say something about that Wolfgang uh, says about this connection and the links we need with it, with, between activism and academy. And I think it's really, really important that connection, but also we need to, to pay attention that there are a lot of prejudice, I don't know if they correct the word, uh, related to those of us that define ourselves as also both activism 
an academic. And, I th and I'm, I'm saying that because that's one of the things that maybe many community psychologists of my generation that also define ourselves as activism, we have a lot of uh, problems and barriers in the academic world and also a uh, world and also in the activism. I don't know if I, it's clear my point, but I yes. think it's really uh, important to say to say that, that there are many younger and um, new generation community psychologists that uh, we are making a lot of effort trying to connect um, this world, you know, because we are part of these social movements, also feminist, ecological, and also poverty in our countries. And I think it's, it's really important to, to, to put this in the discussion in the Congress, in the conference, in the academic world. Thank you for that. And it's a great, it's really great to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you too. Thank you all for coming. Our time is up. Uh, we really appreciate your comments and we hope to see more of you during the rest of the conference. So take good care. Bye. And Bye. thank you Eva, for organizing Bye. this. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.